Jesus willingly sacrificed, sacrificed his life. During World War II, there was a Japanese prisoner of war camp. We read about it in the book, Through the Valley of Kwai, written by Ernest Gordon, who was a chaplain at Princeton. He, he was a prisoner in World War II. And you probably heard of the movie, The Bridge Over the River Kwai. Well, it's, happened, it's what happened among these English, Australian, Scottish prisoners of war. One day, they went out into the fields to work. At the end of a hard day of work, the Japanese soldiers lined up the prisoner of war, counted the tools, and found that one shovel was missing. The Japanese guard cocked his rifle, said, who stole the shovel? Nobody responded. The Japanese guard said, all die, all die. One Scottish soldier stepped forward and said, I stole the shovel. Instantly, he was shot dead. His body, buddies gathered up his body, gathered up the tools, went back to the prisoner of war camp. Inside the camp, the guards counted the tools again. They found that no shovel was missing. That Scottish soldier sacrificed his life so that his buddies might live. What happened on the cross is Jesus sacrificed his life so that you and I might live. Yeah, that's what I'm saying. That's irrational. Yeah. There was not no irrational. justice there. There was no, no justice job. there. I mean, no justice yeah, there. The guy came to and took credit for something no one asked him to take credit for for I mean, something he didn't words, do. Words, you know, there's no justice. He saw the situation, and the situation was his buddies were going to be unfairly slaughtered. So he willingly sacrificed his life. That is what Christ did on the cross. He willingly sacrificed his life. I am trying to rip apart the smoke screen that people put between themselves and Christ. In my afterlife, I'll worry about that later. This life right now, I'll worry about right now. I can't put my trust in something that was written 2,000 years ago. And a bunch of us are running away from God, are running away from Christ as fast as we can. You must save yourself. No one will do it for you. Maybe what you think or I believe is the misinterpretation. Well, take it from me. Go to the source document, the Gospels, and read about Jesus for yourself. If you genuinely want to know Christ, not going to play hide and seek with you, you'll fight. He gave you a gift of free will. But knew that we would use it evilly. Because of his perspective outside of space and time, God sees tomorrow. So God sees what you and I will freely choose to do. But it's you doing it. It's not God doing it. Well, but it's evil through omission. If I, uh, if I see a guy about to shoot someone else, right, and I, and I neglect to do anything about it, even though it's within my power to do so, then uh, aren't I guilty of this guy being shot? God has chosen to create a world where you have a real free will, and he's chosen to set up what is called cause and effect. And he's not going to supernaturally intervene and cause the gun to misfire every time someone points it at an innocent person. But there's coming a day of judgment when he will haul you and me before him and hold us responsible for the free decisions that we make. But if he's the ultimate cause, then he's responsible. Because we always go back to the cause, the root of the problem, right? So God is responsible for the gun going on. No. The university is not responsible for what you choose to do with your education. But you're rejecting causality now. I thought that was part of rationality, isn't it? No. It is totally irrational for you to blame the University of Arizona for what you do with the good education they give you. They give you a gift. How you choose to use that gift is your business. But if they give me a bad education, then I can blame them, right? If they give you a bad education, then they have not done what they said they were going to do. They've lied to you. So I can blame them for that? You cannot blame them for the irresponsible decisions that you make. You can blame them for not doing as good a job as they could have done. So I can blame God for not doing as good a job as he could have done. Which means you got a better way of doing it, so tell me what it is. Well, no, I'm not saying I do. Yes, it does. I can blame if you're God. saying that God has done a bad job, it implies there's a better way that you know how to do it. Well, not have people kill you. Yes, it does. Well, okay, let's not have people kill each other. Fine. Fine, but you take, you've stripped us of our freedom. 
Have I? You sure have. Not any more than omniscient size. You have stripped us of our freedom if you say, I cannot take this hand and roll it into a fist and knock his block off. You, you can't, if you're going to strip me of my freedom, you're going to turn me into a machine. You see, when you give a person the ability to love, it means that they have the ability to hate, because love implies freedom. If I can love, it means I can choose to really care, which means I can choose not to care. I can choose to hate and do violence. But doesn't God have, God's omniscience take away our freedom of choice? This if when we a strong argument. If, we, if when we say God's omniscience, we mean God writes on a piece of paper what we're going to do tomorrow, locks it in a bank vault, and tomorrow we have to do what's written on the paper, you're right. Freedom of the will no longer exists. But if what we mean when we say God's omniscience is, because he is outside of the dimension of time, God sees tomorrow today, then it means God sees what we will freely choose to do tomorrow. And we still have free will. It is a fact that if there is no God, life is an accident. Life is meaningless. Therefore... Just because an accident doesn't mean it's meaningless. Well, how do you get meaning out of an accident? My life isn't meaningless to me. Ultimately, your life is meaningless. No, it's not meaningless. Oh, yes. Your opinion that my life is meaningless? No, in reality. Putting me down. In, your, in reality, if you're an accident, you don't have meaning to your life. You can give your life meaning. You can say, well, the meaning of my life is to serve God, to make money, make money. What's the meaning of your life? The meaning of my life is to survive, to exist, to be here. I want to go to school. I want to finish school. I want to get a job. I want to make money, maybe have a nice house, have a family. That's the meaning of my life. That's factual. That's here. That's real. No, that's not factual. That's not faith. It's incredible faith what you just said. What you just said is such a faith statement, it's incredible. So you start with your life as an accident, and then you tell me, well, the meaning of my life is to go to school, make money, and have a family. That's so that's opinion. just that, that you've just made up this thing. That's my opinion. It's your fantasy. That's my opinion. In I'm reality, reality, in reality, that's real. your life that's is an accident. It's what meaningless. What did I just say? I'm going to go to school, right? I'm in school right now. That's reality. That's not a fantasy. Next thing, I'm getting a job, right? That's reality. I'm getting a job after I graduate. Yeah, but it ultimately doesn't matter whether you go to school or drop out. It ultimately doesn't matter whether you steal money or work and make money. It ultimately doesn't matter whether you rape a woman or marry a woman. Why does it not ultimately matter? Because life is an accident and you just create your own meaning. But why is there, why is so there Hitler meaning? creates his meaning, Stalin creates his meaning, Mother Teresa creates her meaning. It's all relative. It's all why subjective. Why does that make it meaningless? Why does that make it meaningless? Come on, you guys. Because I, I don't think serve God, my consistently. Life is think consistently. Because I don't serve God, my life is meaningless. Is that what no, you're it's not what I said. What I said that, is, if you but no, that's not what I said. What I said was, if you believe there is no God, then you've got to understand that life is ultimately meaningless. Exactly. Which means the meaning that you attach to your life is simply a fantasy. It's a prejudice. It's a bias. And it doesn't ultimately matter whether you do the opposite of what you're choosing to do, because your life is an accident. That's why, Camus said, you got to consider, why not commit suicide? This whole thing's an accident. Doesn't I'm just arbitrarily attaching meaning to my life. That doesn't make it any more meaningless to me. Some children today are accidents. Does that make them meaningless? It's an accident. It's not meaningless. That's a Your child. Your worldview is, we're all accidents. All of us. So we're all meaningless. Everybody that's go kill your, yourself. That's what your world is. Everybody go kill yourself. We're all meaningless. It's all an accident. We don't serve God, so we're all meaningless. You see, you atheists don't have the courage to live out your atheism. If I did what you did, you'd call me a hypocrite. If I were to say, I believe in Jesus, and then I go out and womanize, you'd call me a hypocrite, and you'd be right. If I say I believe in Jesus, I better not go out and womanize. Similarly, if you tell me that you believe there is no God, but then you tell me that your life has meaning, I'm going to look you in the face and say, you are one hypocrite, because you don't how have the that, courage to live out what you believe. How is that hypocritical at all, that I don't believe in God, that I have no meaning? See, exactly. I don't worship God, because so I'm meaningless. You say, exactly what there you is said. no God, life is ultimately meaningless, but oh then you go God. ahead and attach meaning to your life. That's the same as if I were to say, 
I believe in Jesus, and I'm going out and womanize. I don't have the courage to live out what I believe. If you really believe life is meaningless, live it out. Of course I struggle with doubt. Every single human being struggles with doubt. The question is, what do you do with your doubts? Do you allow your doubts to drive you into unbelief? Or do you allow your doubts to motivate you to study more hard? It is possible that she's not sitting here. It's possible. But right about now, I have to make a decision. And the decision is rather simple. Does the evidence point to her sitting here, in which case I better live that way, or does it not? I can doubt whether God exists. I can doubt whether Jesus Christ is reliable. But the problem is, Jesus revealed that God loves me. Jesus pointed out, there's death, there's judgment, and there's heaven and hell. Which means, i got to make a decision. Was Christ lying, or was Christ speaking the truth? And the only way I, as a thinking human being, can make that decision is by studying the evidence. How did Jesus live his life? How did he treat people? What did he teach ethically? How did he die? Did he really forgive his enemies? Did he really rise from the dead, or did he not? And if I study the evidence and find it pointing to his credibility, then I better make a decision to put my faith in him. Because you see, agnosticism is not an option. Romeo proposed to Juliet. And if Juliet would have looked at Romeo and said, I don't know. I don't know, Romeo. Then the day would have been over. Second day. Romeo could have come to Juliet. I love you, Juliet. Would you marry me? I don't know, Romeo. I don't know. And if they would have continued like that, they would have both died. They did. Exactly. Without marrying each other. See, the point is, when someone loves you and calls you to respond to their love, agnosticism is not an option. Because if you say, I don't know, you are making a decision. And the decision is, no, not now. And so Jesus Christ revealed that God loves you and me, and he calls us to live in relationship with himself. To be agnostic is to say, I don't know, I don't know, which is to say, not now. So Jesus says, you decide how you're going to respond to me. And agnosticism is not an option. Um, why is it that if you've accepted Jesus and you've accepted you know, forgiveness from him and he says he'll free you from sin, why is it that when we ask to be free from certain sins that are we struggle with, why is it that we continue to struggle with them? Okay, good question. This gentleman asks, why, Cliff, although you've put your faith in Christ, do you still struggle with sin? I mean, you ask Jesus to help you, and yet you still struggle with sin for two reasons. First of all, I have built up a lot of excess baggage, a lot of bad habits in my life. And they don't all just disappear like that. The habits that I have developed often are very difficult for me to overcome. And yes, Christ helps me. But I have worn some very deep grooves in my brain about how to respond to certain situations, how to respond to people who treat me a certain way. And it is a challenge to change. Secondly, bottom line is, it's because I don't always want to change. That's my real problem. My real problem is, I do not always want to do it God's way. Frequently, I think, I got a better way of doing it. God, you, Jesus, you tell me to be patient. Well, I think that person needs me in their face to straighten them out. Jesus, you tell me to turn the other cheek. Well, I think in this situation, that person needs me to swat them on the side of the head. Jesus, you tell me to be careful the way I use my tongue. Well, I just want to let it rip right now. It just feels good to let it rip. So the real problem is, I don't want to do it Christ's way all the time. I'm a stubborn rascal. And that's why I need to grow spiritually. That's why I need to be reading the Bible, praying, meeting with other believers. Because I got some bad habits and I got one stubborn will. And I need to grow spiritual muscle so that I can obey Christ when the heat is up, turned up, when the pressure's on. And that's not easy for me. Joseph Campbell, who made the observation that um, religions tend to 
change, as culture changes, as people grow, as people expand their minds and they understand the world, so does the religion. Where, where do you see religion going in the next 10 to 20 years? Where do you see it changing? For example, Scientology, different offshoots of Christianity. What, what, what are your thoughts on that? Well, first of all, Joseph Campbell, fascinating gentleman, grew up in a Catholic home, went to Catholic school through junior high school. And basically, when you take a little bit of a look at Joseph Campbell, you begin to realize that guy was reacting against his strict Catholic upbringing, it seemed. He had a very negative experience, you know, a very overbearing experience with the Catholic Church up through junior high school. And when you study his comments about Christianity, it's a little scary. It seems more like he's just reacting to an overly strict nun. Second point. You're right. One of Joseph Campbell's main points is all religion is essentially the same. It's sort of a spirit that you've got to get into, a spirit of religion. And religion goes in a lot of different directions. And it's all basically true. Well, how can you, as a thinking person, can you buy that line? When you study the Vedas and Upanishads of Hinduism, you realize that God is plural and impersonal. But when you read the Torah and the New Testament, God is singular, one God, and personal. He loves you and he loves me. They can't have it both ways. Either God is impersonal or God is personal. Either God is many, plurality, or God is one. You can't have it both ways. They contradict. When you read the teachings of the Buddha, he was obviously a very wise man who taught moderation, and I respect him, as I'm sure you do. But Buddha never talked about the supernatural, and Buddha never talked about supernatural aid. But blast it all, when you read the Old and New Testament, you got God giving supernatural aid to the Jews to get them out of Egypt. You got Jesus performing miracles. You got Jesus rising from the dead. You got supernatural aid all over the place. So what's the story? Is there a supernatural God who wants to help you and me? Or is there no supernatural God? Is there just teachings on how to live your life? Be a good guy. So which way is it? You see, so I, I respect Joseph Campbell as a, as a thinking gentleman, but I don't see how a person can agree with him after studying the major world religions and seeing that there are some fundamental contradictions. They're not all saying the same. Where, where do you see the uh, eventuality of the understanding of God coming for his children? Um, supposedly, the Christians believe he'll be, he'll be coming soon. Supposedly, he'll be coming for his his church. Uh, do you think that's a reality in, in, in modern times, in, the, in this the century, in the millennium ends and starts anew? Do you see actually God coming for his children and the world changing? All right. As, as it is described in the Bible, do you see that as, as a reality? Okay. A lot of my friends say to me, Cliff, just be optimistic about the future. And I say, why? Why should I be optimistic about the future? And they say, well, because positive thinking will help you get ahead. But my question is, why should I be positive about the future in light of all the suffering, evil, and death around me? Now, I am an optimist, but there's a reason I'm an optimist. And that's because I'm convinced that history is not going to end with a nuclear bang as we blow ourselves to bits. History is not going to end as the sun burns out and we all freeze to death. Instead, I'm convinced that Jesus Christ spoke the truth when he promised to return a second time. And yes, sir, Jesus promised that human history would come to a close when he returned a second time, not as a baby born in a manger, but in power and great glory. And the reason that I trust Jesus is because three days after he died, he rose from the dead. And that resurrection of Christ points me to his trustworthiness, his reliability. So the reason that I'm an optimist is because I'm convinced history is not a meaningless cycle of events. History was begun by God when he created the heavens and the earth. Genesis 1 records that. And human history will come to a close when Christ returns a second time. That's why I'm an optimist. Are you an optimist regarding the future? Well, I, the question that I, that I put forth to you wasn't necessarily whether you were an optimist or whether I was an optimist. I was just trying to get your take on how you saw or what you see as happening if God comes and, and for his church. I mean, how, what's your outlook on, on life? How do you think it'll change? I mean, from what I understand, he's going to come. Everything's going to change. Uh, uh, for his church is going to be, it's going to be like uh, life, life on uh, heaven on earth. 
for a certain time after he comes again. Now, I'm just saying, right. I'm just trying to identify with the reality of that. I mean, is that plausible? Is that, is that so, I mean, how, how, how do you think it's, what's your take on that when he does come back? Well, see, that, that's what I was trying to answer. See, I'm an optimist regarding the future because I'm convinced that Jesus Christ is returning a second time. There'll be a day of judgment, there'll be a real heaven and a real hell. Now, I deserve to go to hell, but I know I'm going to heaven because I put my faith in Christ and he's forgiven me for my sin and he's given me a gift, eternal life. But because I'm convinced he's returning, I'm an optimist. I can hardly wait. Because you see, because I believe that Jesus is returning and there'll be a day of judgment and a heaven and a hell, I know that justice is going to win. Listen to the Negro spirituals. Listen to the slaves of the black African-American slave. They looked forward to the return of Christ because they knew that on that day, justice would win. No more evil perpetrated on them by powerful white racists. And that's the type of hope that I have because life is unfair. Life throws screwballs at you and me. Life hurts often and death stinks. But Jesus Christ promised to return a second time there'd be a resurrection from the dead, a day of judgment, a separation, a real heaven, a real hell. And that's why I look forward to the future, because I know that in the end of human history, justice, goodness, kindness, triumphs, evil injustice is defeated. Have I answered you or not? Well, I'm just trying to get a, an idea of, okay, let's see he comes down. Okay, here he is, second coming. And what happens to the financial markets? What happens to mortgage rates? What happens to uh, the way we look at life in general? Is it all just going to go to hell? No, real is it all, is it all just gonna when Jesus Christ returns a second time, Wall Street will close up. <laughs> Everything will shut down real quick, and there'll be a day of judgment, and there'll, then there'll be real heaven and real hell. And the University of Arizona will shut down. And the Arizona Wildcats will not be playing any more football or basketball. And there won't be any more Final Four. Yes, sir. So why do we exist? Why, why do we did, exist? Why did God create us? Well, if there is no God, there is no answer to the question why we exist. If there is no God, you're a hunk of primordial slime evolved to a higher order, and that's all I am. And life is a cosmic accident. But Jesus Christ insisted God created you and me for a purpose, and that purpose is to love and worship God and to love and serve each other. That's why education is good. Education is good because education is developing your mind so that you can serve God by serving people more productively, more effectively. That's why if you put your faith in Christ, you study harder because you begin to realize the motive for me to get an education is not just to get a higher paying job. Rather, the motive for me to get an education is so I can develop my God-given talents so that I can serve people and produce a better product more efficiently and effectively. And when you put your faith in Christ, you understand I'm a steward of the money that I have. And I'm not just going to hoard it all for myself. I'm going to learn to share with God's unfed children and I'm going to learn to make a difference in this world for Christ by helping people. Why do you think Mother Teresa worked among the dying in Calcutta, India? A Duke University student said, because she had a drive to preserve the genetic pool. <laughs> Trash. Wrong. Eh, time out. Mother Teresa worked among the dying in Calcutta, India, because she understood God has called me to do this, and I love these people, and I want to help them die with dignity. And when you put your faith in Christ, be you a CEO, a CFO, or a UFO, be you a street cleaner, a janitor, a professional athlete, that doesn't matter. Whatever you do, you do to serve Christ by serving people. <laughs> what I always hear, like, pastors, all, all kinds of people say is that God, one of our requirements, requirements is to worship God and that he requests that. Well, I can understand, I can understand wanting us to love each other and wanting us to love and appreciate him, but it seems odd to me that a father figure giving a gift to his children 
um, ever truly expects that in return. I mean, just like a parent with a small child, you really don't, you give them their, your love and attention and everything freely. You don't give it expecting to be worshipped in return. You hope for it, and you want it, and you desire it, but I don't see where it, it just seems strange to me that it's demanded or expected to worship. Good it's question. Just a bizarre. Great question. The question this woman asks is, why does God demand that we worship God? And the answer to that is very simple. For your well-being, for my well-being. What does it mean to worship? To worship means to consider ultimately worthy. To worship means to consider ultimately worthy. And all of us worship someone or something. You can worship your boyfriend, you can worship sex, you can worship a career, a corporation, a salary, a rung on the corporate ladder, you can worship athletics. You are going to consider someone or something ultimately worthy. Now, if you and I live for a person, we're setting ourselves up for some incredible pain. If you and I worship money, we are setting ourselves up for a major midlife crisis, for some incredible pain. If you and I worship athletics, one day the elasticity is going to drain out of our legs and our life will be over. And we're setting ourselves up for some incredible pain and despair. But when you and I worship God, when you and I consider Jesus Christ ultimately worthy, he gives our life a fulfillment, a depth, a fullness, a richness, a wideness, a breadth that is exciting. So you see, the reason that God calls you and me to worship him is not because God has a weak ego that needs to be massaged by our worship. No, quite to the contrary. God calls us to worship him for our benefit, not for his benefit. God doesn't need my worship. God doesn't need your worship worshiping God, worshiping Christ, which is simply another way of saying, considering him ultimately worthy. I think it's the connotations that go with the word worship that caught me up. Right. You know, the pictures that you get in your mind. Of, yeah, right. To worship means, to some people, to sort of grovel in the dirt and go, oh, 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 oh I believe in God. No, that's not worship. To worship means to stand in awe to reverence God. It means to love him, to adore him, to praise him, to thank him, to live a life of gratitude to him for all the gifts he's given us. That's what worship means. Worship is not groveling in the dirt. <laughs>